Hey, welcome everybody. Good to see you again. Welcome, welcome. We'll uh, give some people a minute or so to join in, and then we will get going. So the uh, as we said last time, we're going to begin by finishing up this table. So hopefully you had a chance to go through this on your own, so you could try this out as well as working through some of the mastering chemistry, I see um, a lot of you have made your way through that, which is great. So we'll give everybody about a minute or so to join in and then go from there. As usual, you can either comment in the chat, which seems to be a little bit more quick, more synchronous, uh, but I've got the Discord open as well and answering questions there also. Uh oh, Daisy says she can't hear me. Can anyone else hear me? Let me see. Okay, Alyssa can hear. So I'm guessing it's your equipment, Daisy. Um, check your volume settings and your all that kind of stuff. Okay, got a couple more confirmations that they can hear me. So I'm going to go ahead. Um, sorry, Daisy, I can't uh, fix your stuff from here. But if you can't figure it out, well, you can't hear me anyway. So I don't know why I'm talking to you on this. Okay. Oh, now you can hear me. Okay, good. Because um, that that didn't make sense. All right, let's let's get going with this table then. So we talked last time about how we determine first if something's a pure substance or a mixture, and then if it is, and then the further classification: is it an element or a compound? And is it a homogeneous or heterogeneous mixture? So let's take that two-step method throughout this table to review from last time. OK, uh, so a lead weight that has this sort of a formula. First of all, is it a pure substance or mixture? If you recall, the definition there has to do with whether or not it can be broken down physically or if it has to actually be broken down chemically. So can you separate the components without changing the identity of those components? If so, then it's a mixture. If by breaking them down, you actually change what they are, then it's a compound. And, and we'll talk about those changes in a little bit. But this is clearly just one element. So that's a pure substance and an element. Okay, it's only made of one type of atom, lead atoms. OK, uh, so next we've got baking soda, pure substance or mixture. Now, it's clearly made of multiple elements. But we have to decide, does that make it a mixture or does that make it a compound? And in this case, it's a compound because those, those elements, those atoms that we see here, are chemically bound together. If we were to separate the sodium or separate the carbon or the oxygen or something, that would make whole new different compounds. So that makes this also a pure substance and a compound. We talked about this one orange juice with pulp. You can probably figure that that is not a pure substance. That's going to be a mixture. Lots of different types of compounds in orange juice. You've got the sugar, you've got color, flavors, water, um, vitamin C, whatever else. And uh, in this case, it's specified that it's with the pulp. So that's really our hint that this is a heterogeneous mixture, that we can see the pulp as being separate from the rest of the orange juice. All right, raisin bread, again, made of lots of stuff.
these kinds of things could potentially go either way, depending on your own experience. So when I think of raisin bread, I think of bread with raisins in it. Um, but, you know, that, that may not be the only kind of raisin bread. Maybe there's a raisin bread where everything gets blended up together and then baked. That would be more of a homogeneous mixture because it would, you know, be uniform throughout. So a little bit depends on your experience. Hydrogen here is a pure substance. But watch the formula here. Actually, let me pull that up. I don't know if you can see that. Watch the formula here because it, it is H2. So hydrogen and several other elements, um, nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine, chlorine, bromine, and iodine, exist as diatomic molecules, meaning that there's a molecule of two of them connected together. That's still a pure substance because it's still only made of one type of atom. So we're still going to call that uh, an element and a pure substance, not a compound. There are, there is more than one atom of hydrogen in a molecule of hydrogen, but that is still just made of hydrogen and, and nothing else. All right, so for table salt, then we have NaCl. Again, that is a pure substance. We can see by the formula that the, com that the ele elements are somehow chemically bound, bound together in the next chapter we'll talk about, or a couple chapters, we'll talk about what that interaction looks like and, and what that, that bond means. For now, we can just go by the formula and say if, if all those elements are kind of mashed together in the same formula, we know that they're, they're part of the same thing. So that's a compound. And then salt water has actually the same formula, but, but there's a little tricky bit here um, that we looked at last time, AQ, which we defined as aqueous, Whoop, there's no e in there's no e in aqueous um, dissolved in water. Oh, there is an e in aqueous. There's not an e in the end of aqueous. Uh, it means dissolved in water. And so in this case, we do have a mixture because we have salt, we have sodium chloride, and then we have water. So that is a mixture. And in that case, in this case, it would probably be we would probably describe it as homogeneous because the uh, salt would be dissolved and distributed throughout. So to introduce another term here, in something like salt water, another way of talking about a homogeneous mixture is to talk about a solution. Now, that's not always the case. There are homogeneous mixtures there are, that are not solutions, but Solution is probably the most common type of homogeneous mixture that we're going to see. And a solution is simply a, a homogeneous mixture where the um, distribution is such that all the way down to the atomic level, things are interspersed evenly. So even if you were to zoom all the way down in there, you would see pretty even distributions. You wouldn't see lumps of one thing and another thing in different places. So if you hear that word solution, that's what we're talking about. All right. So we did. Uh, any questions? I guess before I go on here, check the Discord. Hopefully those worked out for you okay. And th this next part will help you as, as well to make those distinctions. The um, we keep defining mixture as mixture versus pure substance. We keep defining it based on how you separate it. We haven't really talked about separations, changes of state, so we're going to do that now. Um, so when we change state, I'm sure you've seen these kinds of things before. You, you've seen ice and you know water and water vapor, and so we can put these. Uh, let's put these terms in here that that you've probably heard before, but just to make sure that when a solid, um, well here let's let's start at the bottom. When a solid becomes a liquid, we call that melting. And when a liquid becomes a solid, we call that freezing. Now watch, the, note for this plus and minus here. That has to do with the energy. Do we have to put energy in for that process or does that process emit energy, give energy off? And sometimes this is a little bit counterintuitive. So melting requires we put energy in. That kind of makes sense, right? You've got some solid, you've got some ice, you have to heat it to get it to melt. You have to put energy in to get it to melt. But it's not just about changing the temperature. In fact, you need to put energy in 
even not changing the temperature to get that to melt. And in fact, when liquid freezes, this is the more counterintuitive one, when liquid freezes, it gives off energy. We don't usually think about that because we think about freezing as something that happens when it's cold. Um, but it is indeed true that when something freezes, it gives off energy. When water freezes, it gives off energy. So on the other side then, we have liquid going to gas, which we call evaporation or sometimes boiling. And then we have also uh, gas going to liquid, which is the opposite of that, and that is condensation. Again, the energy difference to get from a liquid to a gas, you have to put energy in. A gas to a liquid, energy is released. And this is one reason that steam is so dangerous for burns, because if you have water vapor and it contacts your skin, it actually condenses and releases all that energy into your skin. So it makes the burn a lot worse. The other side over here, we don't think of as much when we talk about water, but water does participate in this as well, going directly between a solid and a gas. So a solid directly to a gas is called, I'm going to write it kind of over here so it's not too small, sublimation. And a gas going directly to a solid is called deposition. Um, you actually do see that in the freezer. Like we talk about freezer burn when things dry out in the freezer. Well, if, if the only way something can evaporate is to become a liquid first, that's not really happening much in your freezer at super low temperatures. So what's actually happening is over time, there is some sublimation and some of the frozen water in that stuff does end up uh, sublimating and becoming a gas and then escaping. Um, and then the deposition, you can kind of see that too. I, it it, it kind of goes along. It's not just deposition. It's also condensation and freezing, but the, the kind of... Um, frost that happens in your freezer. Some of that is just the humidity in the air that's condensing and then freezing, but a little bit of it is probably also depositing, is probably also deposition. When we think about sublimation and deposition, um, the classic examples that we'll see in lab are dry ice and iodine. Dry ice is ca uh, solid carbon dioxide, which if you've seen, you know, if you like leave it down, it kind of exudes all that smoke. Uh, it's that ice that like smokes, and that's going directly to carbon dioxide. Again, as with water vapor, the smoke actually isn't carbon dioxide because carbon dioxide is colorless. The smoke is condensing water vapor uh, on the very cold carbon dioxide. Iodine, you might have less experience with, but iodine is a purple solid that uh, sublimates to a purple gas and doesn't doesn't really melt. Oh, thank you. Um, so does sublimation require energy? or give off energy. Yeah, let's go add those. Let's think about it. Um, so based on the pattern here, anybody, what do you think? Do you think sublimation requires putting energy in, or do you think sublimation gives off energy? If we're sort of following the pattern of the other phase changes. What's your guess? Absorbs or gives off? Guessing gives gives off, gives off. Everybody's guessing gives off. Um, all right, well, well uh, good guesses, but no, that's not correct. Um, it's, the, it's the opposite. Sublimation requires energy and deposition gives off energy. That's okay. It's always good to guess now. Don't guess on the test, guess now. You know what, actually, I'm not going to be as glib about that. It really depends on the substance. Um, this is not always necessarily true. I believe it's true for water, but we should look that up. Because uh, I don't actually know the those energies, and, and you might actually be right. Um, so let's, let's put those in parentheses and check them out later. All right. 
So any questions, any other questions about phase changes? Let me look that up real quick while we're thinking about it. Yeah, so I, w I was correct. Um, sublimation requires heat and deposition gives off heat for water at least. Okay, so let's talk about separation techniques. Um, again, if you've got any questions, just jump in there. I can, I can see the chat. So let me know if anything comes up, anything else comes up. I wanna talk a little bit about the separation techniques. And if you can do these things, then it means that you have a mixture. So sometimes a mixture is really easy to separate. Like we talked about rocks in water or something. You can just take the rocks out. But sometimes mixtures are much more difficult to separate, like salt and water or water and ethanol together. Um, so here are some different techniques that you might encounter. We'll be doing quite a few of these this year in lab, but um, a couple of them maybe not. There are these really small pictures here, so I don't know if they're going to come through with great resolution, but you can you can look at the... Um, you can look at the terms and, and look up the picture if you don't understand. So first we have filtration, and I, I'm not going to um, necessarily follow the, the directions here, but I do want to kind of tell you about these, what these methods entail, and then you can probably figure out what's happening from there. But if not, certainly ask. So for filtration, you've experienced this, uh, where you have some sort of a paper or a, a barrier that only lets things of a certain size through and the solid material gets separated from the liquid material. Uh, one note here is the solid material has to be big enough, the pieces of it have to be big enough to actually stay in that filter paper. So filtration doesn't work for, um, for example, solutions because the small ions will go through the filter paper. So you need slightly bigger, um, bigger pieces for that. And, and so this is generally used with heterogeneous mixtures. All right, moving down. Evaporation. So if you simply take your evaporating dish, which you had in the drawers, you might have seen last week, a little porcelain dish, you heat it up. Eventually the water, let's, let's say there's a, it's a water and a, and a solid, eventually the water will evaporate and leave behind whatever was dissolved in the water. So this is a good way to separate the um, liquid and solid parts. The drawback, of course, is the liquid just sort of goes away as vapor, so you're really only left with the solid in that case. Centrifugation is uh, related to filtration, I would say, when something is spinning really fast with small holes around the outside, um, in this example, some things get caught inside and other things get pushed to the outside. And the reason that works is because there's a really, really intense amount of force um, that's pushing stuff out. So you can really kind of squeeze things through very, very small openings. Centrifugation also works with things like blood where the difference in densities means that the, the blood cells will end up kind of at the bottom of a tube where the liquid will go to the top. And since ev all the solids will get compacted, um, those will get separated that way, and then you can just pour off the liquid. So that's another another use for centrifugation, and um, that would be a generally used for heterogeneous mixtures. Chromatography is where you have um, generally a homogeneous mixture, and it's deposited on some sort of a substance like a piece of paper or silica, and some substances stick to that better than others. And so the ones that stick better will kind of stay toward the bottom, and as a solvent or a gas or something is passed through it, the other parts will be drawn up. And so you can see um, the classic example is like if you get some ink wet and you can see the ink kind of spreading out into its constituent colors. That's a type of chromatography. There's also gravity separation, where we simply let things sit, and the more dense part will go to the bottom. This is going to only work for heterogeneous liquids, a uh, mixture of liquids. 
where the heavier, the more dense liquid goes to the bottom. In this case, it's water uh, and like, uh, what is it? The kerosene oil. So some sort of hydrocarbon will float above the water. And then if you have a, um, a spout on the bottom, then you can let one out and separate it that way. Okay, going over to the other side. Absorption. Um, it's a separation technique, like sponging or using a sponge or a mop, where you are really, uh, you are removing the water again and leaving the solid or whatever whatever's kind of in the bottom behind. So that's again going to work for heterogeneous mixtures. Magnetic separation, of course, removing magnetic solids from non-magnetic solids. So that's going to work for uh, generally heterogeneous mixtures of solids. Sieving, which is um, similar to filtration, but for only solids, where smaller solids pass through a screen and the larger solids stay, stay uh, in that screen. Decanting, we talked about that a little bit with uh, a flask. So this, in this example, you've got some wine and the, the dregs at the bottom of the wine can stay behind in the decanter as the wine, the, the liquid part is poured off. And we talked about that that also works with a, nicely with a flask. Uh, when you tip it to pour it out, um, when you tip it to pour it out, the solids can stay in the bottom. And then finally, distillation. This one's really hard to see. So if you don't know what distillation is, I would uh, encourage you to look it up. Just look up, look for a picture and what it is. You're heating a mixture of liquids and separating by boiling point. So the liquid that boils first evaporates first, goes up this column, then condenses in a condenser that's like kind of got a water jacket on the outside. So it stays cool. It condenses there and then drips into another container. And because of the difference in boiling point, you can switch containers and you can collect the different substances. We're not going to do a distillation in this lab, but if you go on and take some organic chemistry, then you'll get to do some distillations there. And that's how more concentrated uh, alcoholic drinks like brandy are made. We take something with less alcohol like wine or just um, anything that's been fermented, which is usually in the 10% range or so, and then concentrate it by evaporating the alcohol off first uh, and, and concentrating that alcohol. So these are all different ways to separate mixtures. And some of them, some of them are pretty obvious, but other ones like, like distillation, you can separate something that looks very, very well combined. If you've got two liquids combined, that can sometimes look like a compound when it's really a heterogeneous mixture that can be separated. So when you're answering these questions like, like we had above here, is this thing a, sub, a compound or a mixture? You can think about whether or not you can separate it in these ways. And so there's a question, is that similar to how people on Survivor make clean water when they boil the salt water or dirty water? Uh, yeah, exactly, yeah. You can um, evaporate the water and then everything else stays behind. Note that when you evaporate water, whether it's boiling on a stove or just leaving out in the sun or distilling or whatever, note that you're not changing the structure of the water. We're never breaking the hydrogen and oxygen bonds. We're never making hydrogen and oxygen. We're always just keeping water, but putting it into different physical states. All right, so along with this then, just getting a little close to the edge. Let me see. Okay. Uh, along with this, we can define physical versus chemical changes and physical versus chemical properties. And we're going to do this in lab this week and next week, depending on which section you're in, where we're going to look at some substances and try to determine physical and chemical properties and physical and chemical changes. So, in general, we're going to say that physical properties are characteristics that a substance displays without changing the chemical composition, and chemical properties are only displayed through chemical through uh, chemical reactions or changes in chemical composition. So, can anybody um, drop in what you think might be a an example of a physical property of anything? 
like pick your favorite substance that you can see somewhere wherever you're sitting and uh, type in a physical property of it. Remember, any characteristic that that substance displays without changing the chemical composition. Freezing water. Yeah, so freezing water is a physical change. What about just a physical property? Like, so take, take half of that, either ice or water. What's a thing that it exhibits or a characteristic that it has that is, that is physical? How do you observe that? So carbonation in the soda is another example. Wh what is, what's a characteristic of it? I think everybody's making this too difficult. Yeah, like physical properties are, are kind of like what it looks like. So things like color, shape, um, appearance in, in other ways, you know, if it's shiny or not. Yeah, if it looks kind of solid, if it's reflective, um, solid versus liquid, just the state of it is a physical property. Yeah, cold would be a physical property, right? Uh, cold actually might be, um, might not be, be really a property because it changes depending on the situation. But certainly um, frozen, you know, or, or having a, a particular melting point would be a physical property. Yeah, clear. Clear would definitely be a physical property, something that you can see through. All right. So then when we determine, um, yeah, color would be, a, exactly, color would be, a, um, a physical property. So when we determine physical versus chemical change, we want to look at, is it just changing its appearance but not its composition? And sometimes this gets kind of tricky, especially when we think about color. So color is a physical property, but most substances, with some exceptions, most substances don't change their color with physical changes. So if you have a, um, if you have a solution, let's say, that is blue, and you heat it up, and it turns orange, that's probably evidence of a chemical change because you've now changed some sort of thing about the, the system that has actually made it change color. Now, there's some exceptions for that. Like sometimes if you take a rock that looks, you know, rock-ish, gray, I don't know, and you like crush it up, it'll have a different color of the small particles because of how the light reflects off of it. Um, but in general, if all you've done is kind of heat something or mix some things and you have a significant chemical, uh, significant color change, that's usually good evidence of a uh, chemical change. And I'm not going to write these lists here. I want you to find these, but I think you'll see as we kind of go. Um, some other things are, uh, yeah, so like um, avocado is a good example. If you've ever had an avocado, you leave it out, um, what happens? It gets brown, right? It gets brown pretty fast. And that's because of oxidation. That's because of the um, the, the lipids, the fats in the avocado reacting with oxygen in the air and going bad. And, and so if you, um, to prevent that, a couple of things you can do is one, you, if you like, if you have plastic wrap or something, you can make sure it's smashed all the way down on the surface so that there's no air bubbles and that prevents some air contact. However, plastic wrap actually is somewhat air permeable. So eventually it will still contact oxygen. Um, you can also add some things to it like, um, antioxidants, some of these like anti-browning compounds, which are types of antioxidants, prevents that, that oxidation. But yeah, that's an example of a chemical change there. Um, a physical change to an avocado might be, you know, smashing it and making some uh, guacamole or something. All right, let's take a look at this table down here. There's also a lot of good examples in the book about 
um, how to distinguish these and, and what they are. So let's take a look at these properties and decide if they are physical or chemical properties. So I'll start with the first one. The first one, boiling point, that's a physical property. And the way we know that is that when something boils, it doesn't change its composition. When a, when a compound, a pure substance boils, it stays that pure substance. Flammability, that should have two Ms, sorry. Uh, flammability, what do you think about that? Is that physical or chemical? First guess is chemical. Yes, that is chemical. The reason that it's chemical, or the reason that we can tell it's chemical, is because the compounds have changed. So think about wood burning. When wood burns, it you know it kind of turns red, and then it turns black, and then it's not there anymore. Um, you're not just evaporating the wood. Uh, you're ex you're emitting a bunch of heat. When we burn wood, we don't put the heat into the wood. I mean, we set it on fire at first, but once it's burning, it's actually giving off all that heat. So that heat, that energy has to come from somewhere, and the place that it comes from is the chemical bonds. So, um, so that's a chemical change. We're changing that. And in fact, it, a long time ago, they used to think that you were actually just making that disappear, but now we know that it's actually changing into something else. It's changing into gas. Um, and so in, in the burning example, most things containing carbon that burn, produce carbon dioxide and water, sometimes other things, depending on how much oxygen is there. Uh, so you're really changing the internal state of that, what that is. All right, reactivity, that's definitely chemical, right, a chemical reaction. So how something reacts is a chemical property. So if you read something like this compound, if you're reading the safety information and it says this reacts with oxygen, that's an example of a chemical property. Toxicity, also chemical, because that's describing a reaction. How does it interact with things in your body? That's its toxicity. And finally, odor. Um, odor, we generally think of as a physical property. Uh, you could probably make the argument that there's something chemical about how it interacts in your with your senses in your nose or something, but, but I would call that a physical property. So those are properties. Let's talk about changes. So when this thing happens, is that primarily a physical or a chemical change? In some cases, it's going to be both. But what's the main thing going on here? So when a firework goes off, is that primarily a physical or a chemical change? What do you think? Why, so uh, first guess is physical. Why physical? Second guess is chemical. Why chemical? Anybody want to try to put in any reasoning for this? What's your thought? It's OK if it's just a guess. But if you had some reasoning behind it, what was it? All right, I'm not getting any responses, so I will uh, move on. Um, fireworks is a chemical change. And the reason we can tell that is because of the changes. I mean, if you've seen, um, oh, there it goes. So chemical because the properties of the firework change when it explodes. Yeah, the, the identity of it changes. What's, what, it's, what the actual compounds are changes. If you think about what a firework looks like on the shelf versus what a firework looks like in the air as it's exploding, uh, very different, right? And giving off energy and all this stuff. So when we when we give off energy, when we give off light, when we drastically change what this thing is, that's examples of chemical changes. All right, uh, cracking an egg. That one is physical. So that's a physical change. We haven't changed anything about the egg except that it's in a different form. So we just cracked it, so it's physical. 
If we were to fry that egg, though, that becomes more chemical. And in fact, most cooking involves chemical changes. So when you're applying heat to food to change something about it, change how it tastes, change how it forms, right? If you have cake batter and then you bake it, you're clearly changing what that is. Um, you're doing some reactions in there, some chemical reactions. Uh, so those are all examples of chemical changes. And then this last one, dissolve sugar in water and then evaporate the water in like, a, like rock candy. Notice what we're doing here. This is an example of a physical change because we haven't ever changed what we have. We have sugar, and we have water, and all we've done is combine them. So we've made a mixture or a solution and then we've separated that mixture. So made a, make a mixture, separate the mixture, that's physical changes. We haven't really changed the identity of any of those compounds. All right, the last thing we're gonna do in this unit is uh, temperature scales. You'll be able to practice this a little bit in the homework as well. Um, I will say you don't need to memorize these equations. You'll always have access to these temperature conversion equations, but I do want you to know how to use them and why, why we do these types of conversions. So if we look at a thermometer here in some water, we can kind of orient ourselves on the scale a little bit. If you grew up in this country, then you're probably most used to the Fahrenheit system and where water boils at 212 degrees Fahrenheit, Normal body temperature is 98.6, and freezing or melting point of water is 32 degrees Fahrenheit. And you're probably very familiar with those numbers if, if that's your experience. If you're from somewhere else, you may be more comfortable in the Celsius system, shown here, where water boils at 100 degrees C, freezes at zero, and normal body temperature is 37. For all of you, regardless of where you or what, what your comfort level is with these systems, I would say you should know these basic landmarks around the temperature scale. Um, and there's a reason for that. We're going to be doing these conversions, and if you flip a conversion or you get it wrong, it's going to be really wrong, and it really helps if you know, like if you have a sense of the scale, then you know what will happen when you get, that you know that you will be really wrong because it won't make any sense. So if you know that normal body temperature is 37, and you're converting like s some number over here between 37 and 100 to Fahrenheit, then you know your answer's gotta be between 98.6 and 212. So having those kind of in you um, is helpful. In lab, we will be using the Celsius scale pretty exclusively. We will talk a little bit about the Kelvin scale, but we won't use it a whole lot in, in this class. So the tricky thing about converting between temperature scales, we haven't really talked about unit conversions. We'll do those a little bit later. But with temperature scales, they, they're off in a couple different ways. So at an, in one way, they start at a different spot. So 0 degrees C is 32 degrees F. So there's this 32 degree offset. 0 degrees C is 273 K. So that's a 273 degree offset. Um, so there's that offset from zero. And then there's also a difference in the size of the units. Um, so the distance in, there's about um, 180 degrees between freezing and boiling in the Fahrenheit scale. There's 100 degrees between freezing and boiling in the Celsius scale. So a different, so each unit is a different size. In the Celsius versus Kelvin, the units are actually the same size. It's, so there's only the 273 offset. So zero degrees is 273 Kelvins, 100 degrees C is 373 Kelvins. Um, so it's pretty easy to convert there. You just add 273 to the Celsius temperature. The reason for this Kelvin's scale, the Kelvin scale, is that it doesn't go below zero. And so when you think about all the other units that we use, like grams, milliliters, we, we don't ever talk about negative grams or negative milliliters. Um, and so we need a temperature unit that also begins at zero so that it plays nice with those other units. And so, so Kelvin actually goes to zero, which is called absolute zero, where there is no molecular motion. And we go up from there. The other thing you'll notice is the little degree sign. So Fahrenheit and Celsius are degrees on a scale. 
whereas Kelvin, and that, that has a little bit to do with the negative and positive thing, whereas Kelvin is actually a unit. So when we talk about um, a, a quantity in Kelvin, just like with grams, we talk about, we would say, 373 kelvins with a lowercase k, just like we would with grams or liters or anything else. And you can have millikelvins and kilokelvins or whatever, um, whatever you need. You can use those prefixes just like any other units, whereas these are degrees on their own special scale. All right, so if kelvins is Celsius plus 273, you can probably guess how we get from Kelvin to Celsius. We simply subtract 273. Just doing the opposite there. The equation to convert from Celsius to Fahrenheit is, this is TF is our Fahrenheit temperature, is 1.8 times the Celsius temperature and then plus 32. Be careful of your order of operations here. Remember that multiplication comes before addition. So you have to multiply 1.8 times the Celsius temperature and then add 32. For the opposite, for going from Celsius to Fahrenheit, we can just do a little algebra and solve for the Celsius temperature. If you do that, you get that the Celsius temperature is the Fahrenheit temperature minus 32. And then that is all divided by 1.8. Again, watch your order of operations. You have to do that subtraction first. If you have a fairly modern um, capable calculator and you just type some number minus 32 divided by 1.8, the calculator, especially if it's a graphing calculator, will do the division first because it knows the order of operations. So it'll try to do that division first, but no, we need to do the subtraction first. You'll get the wrong answer um, if you just type it in without doing the subtraction first. So use parentheses or um, just do the subtraction first and then divide. So let's do one of these together and that'll be it for today. Um, you can do a, a Kelvin Celsius one on your own and, and you'll be able to practice these in the homework as well. But the very last one here, your long lost great aunt from France left you a fancy French oven in her will. Unfortunately, it is calibrated in Celsius. You need to bake a cake at 350 degrees Fahrenheit. At what temperature do you set the oven? Now, those of you from um, other places, like from Europe, you probably know uh, the temperature you bake a cake at, the comparable temperature. But let's do that conversion and, and take a look at it. So we'll use this, uh, this formula up here where we plug in the Celsius temperature and solve for Fahrenheit. So our Fahrenheit temperature, let me divide this up a little bit. Too high. Okay. Our Fahrenheit temperature is 1.8 times our Celsius temperature plus 32. In this case, our Celsius temperature, whoop, I did that backwards because we got yeah, we have to go the other way. Sorry. Let's use the other one. We could just solve solve this one. All right. So our Fahrenheit temperature is 350. Subtract 32. Divide point by 1.8. And we get... Hundred and seventy seven. And so that's degrees C. So you would set your oven probably to one eighty, right? Which would be about the same. Okay. So let's look at what happens when we did this wrong. So this is what I'm talking about with the scale. We know water boils at if you know that water boils at two twelve Fahrenheit and hundred degrees C, we know three fifty is more than two twelve, quite a bit more than two twelve. So we're gonna get hundred and seventy seven um, C. So let's say we did this wrong. Let's say we did the we we typed it in our calculator wrong. If you type it in wrong, or if you don't do the subtraction first, you get about 333 instead of 177. So those are very similar numbers, and um, 
that should be kind of right away, you should be able to say, wait, that doesn't make any sense. Because we know that we have to subtract 32 and then divide. It can't be less than, it can't just be 333. That's only 18 less than, or 17 less than 350. So that doesn't make sense. So it's always worth looking at your answer and estimating and thinking if, trying to see if that answer makes sense or not. All right, um, so that's the end of the packet for this unit. Are there any questions or things you want to go over more before we end for tonight? All right, I'll take that as a no. So if you have other things, um, you know where to find me. And um, I will be happy to answer your questions. Hopefully everything is going well online. Don't forget that uh, Monday's a holiday. So the stuff is still kind of, most stuff is still set to be due on Sunday. But then if you don't want to start up again until Tuesday next week, that's fine. We will stick to, I think this schedule seems to be working well for everybody. So it'll be Tuesday, 10 a.m. and Thursday, 7 p.m. And, and we'll just keep going uh, at those times unless unless we have to change for some reason. Uh, so anyway, everybody have a good uh, holiday weekend. Hope you get everything finished up in the unit okay. And I'll see half of you next week. Bye.